irrational functions continued. Um, one thing I haven't gone over is how to find intercepts. We've talked about that before, but it might not be a bad idea to review how to find intercepts. Review, finding, intercepts. Let's take maybe one of the questions we were already doing today. Uh, we could go ahead and use this one. Remember to find to find x, plug in y equals 0 and solve. To find y, plug in x equals 0 and solve or simplify. Okay, here's an example. y equals 2x plus 5 over x minus 6. Let's find the intercepts. So to find the x-intercept, we plug in y equals 0 and we solve. Really what ends up happening when you do that is all you're looking at is the numerator. The reason that all you end up looking, for, looking at is the numerator is that we turn this into a fraction so we can cross multiply, so put it over 1 or any number, it will still be 0. And then we cross multiply, and because we're multiplying this denominator by zero, it doesn't even matter. It doesn't need, we don't need to consider the denominator at all. So all we end up with is zero equals 2x plus 5. Move the 5 to the other side, so 2x equals negative 5, and therefore x will equal negative 5 halves. So there's the x-intercept. There might be more than one, depending on the problem. Okay, now let's do the y-intercept. So to do the y-intercept, we plug 0 in for x. Now this time you do want to keep the denominator there. Just plug 0 in for everything. It's pretty easy. 2 times 0 is 0, plus 5 is 5. 0 minus 6 is a negative 6, so the y-intercept is at negative 5 sixths. Yes, sometimes the intercepts can be in pretty strange places. Fractions are very common, so don't let that concern you. Okay, we're now going to do what you're look at what you're going to be doing in section 5.3, which is taking one problem and doing a bunch of steps to ultimately graph a rational function. Okay, so we are doing seven steps to analyze and graph a rational function. Here are the steps, and as I give each one of them to you, we're going to do it on this example. So the example will be f of x equals x minus 1 over x squared minus 4. Step 1, factor and find domain. Okay, so does anything factor in our problem here? Yes, it does. So the numerator does not factor, but the denominator is x minus 2, x plus 2. So that helps us find the domain. The domain is x such that x cannot equal plus or minus 2. Okay, next step. Let's find the intercepts. We just barely went through an example going over that again. So let's do it. Let's plug 0 in for y, which means we would cross multiply. The entire denominator would turn into 0. So we therefore just have 0 equals x minus 1. Therefore, the x-intercept is at x equals 1. The y-intercept, we take 0 and plug it in for every x value. So x 0 minus 1 over 0 squared minus 4. You can either do it by plugging 0 into the original problem or into the factored problem. It does not matter. So we end up with negative 1 over negative 4, which is really y equals 1 fourth. So there's our, as our um, intercepts. One, an x-intercept at positive 1 and a y-intercept at positive 1 fourth. Okay. Next, find the vertical asymptotes. So 
so we kind of look at the domain we were just barely doing. When we factored the problem, nothing canceled out. So that means there's no holes in the graph. There's just two asymptotes. So the vertical asymptotes are located at x equals 2 and x equals negative 2. If you want to simplify by saying x equals plus or minus 2, that's fine. But don't forget the x equals. It's important for the entire equation of the line to be there. Okay, number four, horizontal or oblique asymptotes. We have to look at the degree. So let's look at our original problem. The degree of the numerator is 1. The degree of the denominator is 2. That makes this possibility number 1. And it's the easiest one there is. There's only one horizontal asymptote. Well, there's usually only, there's only one horizontal or one oblique. That's it. And it is located at y equals 0. Five. Five says to plug in some other numbers and find where the graph is above or below the x-axis. Don't worry about writing in those specific details. Just go ahead and start graphing what you have so far. Graph what you know so far. Okay, so here's a graph. And I'm going to put in my x-intercept at 1, my y-intercept at 1 fourth, a horizontal asymptote at 0, a vertical asymptote at 2, another vertical asymptote at negative 2. Okay, so so far we have our asymptotes, we know the graph is going to go near those areas. It's looking like this is going to go up here maybe, but we may not know for sure. Um, so now, what problem number five asks us to do is plug in a few other x values to determine if graph is above or below. the x-axis between each asymptote. This problem actually gives us an interesting phenomenon. Remember how we said there's a horizontal asymptote at 0? And then I also just got done saying that there's an intercept at 1 that crosses that horizontal asymptote. Graphs can cross a horizontal asymptote. The purpose of the horizontal asymptote is so that these areas of the graph, we know where they are not going to cross. But this section of the graph is not ruled by that horizontal asymptote, and therefore this piece of the graph can cross it. So horizontal asymptotes can be crossed, but vertical asymptotes will never be crossed. Okay. Um, so let's plug in some points over here. So maybe plug in a negative 3 into your original problem. So I'm kind of doing a table of values. Okay, so let's plug in a negative 3 because that's in that section. I'm thinking I should plug in a negative 1 so I kind of know what the graph is doing here. I might want to plug in a positive 1.5 so I can sort of figure out what the graph is doing there. And I probably want to plug in a positive 3 so I can see what the graph is going to do over here. So we go to our original problem, which is now off my screen. So I'm just going to write it down right here. y equals x minus 1 over x squared minus 4. And we start plugging in our x values. So negative 3 minus 1 is negative 4. And then negative 3 squared is 9 minus 4 is 5. The important thing is that this tells us the answer is negative. And so that branch of the graph is going to be below this asymptote, which pretty much tells us that it will be, look something like that. Because it's negative, it's below that asymptote. That's probably enough. Okay, negative 1, we plug in, get negative 2, negative 1 squared is a positive 1, minus 1 is a negative 3, so we get a positive 2 thirds. So, aha, that tells us that at negative 1, this is actually going to be up a little bit here. So, 
based on my experience, I know I can guess pretty well that the graph there is going to look something like that. If you want, you can plug in some other points to make sure. And then last, 3, let's plug in the 3. 3 minus 1 is 2, and 3 squared is 9 minus 4 is 5. That's a positive number. That means our piece is going to be up here. So I'm going to go ahead and put that in. Okay. Step six is one that I'm okay with you skipping if you want to. It says analyze the behavior by the asymptotes. The book has a really strange way of explaining that that I've never felt like analyzing closely because they don't test you on it on the final exam. So really I think all they're wanting you to know is is realize that this piece of the graph is decreasing toward that asymptote and this piece of the graph is increasing toward that one and decreasing toward that one and increasing toward that one, that type of thing. But you can just skip that, don't worry about it. Okay? And then the last step is to put everything together into a graph, which I've pretty much already done as I've gone along. Um, typically you want to label things, like you might want to label your intercepts, so 0, 1 fourth, label your asymptotes, so y equals 0, x equals 2, x equals negative 2. If you found any other points, label those, just make it clear what you're graphing. And then the last step would be to check that answer with the calculator. Alright, here's where we have to talk about something pretty serious. When you do this on the calculator, there's a mode on your calculator that says continuous mode. Is this graph continuous? Obviously not. It has some major breaks in it. So your calculator, if you put it in continuous mode, tries to connect those breaks together. It cannot graph the asymptotes. So you'll get a very strange heartbeat looking graph as your calculator tries to connect things together. It'll look something like that. It'll be very strange. You cannot depend on your calculator for the correct answer, but you can use it to kind of check your work because it will resemble what you were able to figure out on your own. Or another option for you is to change your mode to dot mode. So you just hit the mode button and change it to dot instead of connected. And that graph will end up being, like you'll see even less of it. So students think they're going to get a better look from dot mode, but you don't really. You just, instead of trying to connect the pieces that don't connect, it just starts putting dots where those points would be because it doesn't graph it continuously, it graphs it at certain points. And so you're going to start getting dots as the points get further and further ap apart and it'll kind of look something like that, which sort of still also shows you that you've done it correctly by yourself. The bottom line is you cannot depend on a calculator for graphing rational functions. You have to know these steps, you have to know the procedure, you have to be able to do it by hand to really get an accurate answer. Um, that's one actually nice thing about the calculator, graphing calculators on the iPod is that they do a lot better job with this than the TIs do. But you can't use those on your final exam, so you've got to know how to do this on your own.